Welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast, where every week Danny and Mauda Vega discuss topics that help families live a healthy and active lifestyle with their little ones, including nutrition and training, peaceful parenting, education, and mindset. To stay up to date, make sure to hit subscribe on this podcast and check out the blog at www.fatfuel.family. You can also find them on Facebook and Instagram at dannyvega.ms, at Fat Fueled Mom, and at Fat Fueled Kids, and Fat Fueled Family on YouTube. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Fat Fuel Family Podcast. I am Danny, and I am joined by my beautiful wife, Mauda. Hi. <laughs> we are live. It's <laughs> always awkward every time. That was incredibly awkward. Yo, every time, I love every it's single time it's awkward. You have to understand. And he always uses a different, like, I'm like, what adjective will he describe yeah, you I'm here today? with my I hope everyone gets to see the video Mauda. of that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we're here in a whole different place. We're here at MI40 Gym with one of our best friends. Um, first of all, I'm sipping on some... Green tea with MCT Co. MCT powder. What do you have over there? What's that? Nice coffee. <laughs> Just good old iced coffee. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's not waste any more time. Uh, this week's using matcha, or is it? Did you actually brew that? This is actually the peak tea that I told you about. The Fung, Dr. Fung's. Yeah. Uh, it's higher in the EGCG mm-hmm. and it's instant, and it mixes. Look at that, it mixes perfectly with the MCT powder. I've, I've been messing with some matcha this week, so I've kind of removed my coffee. I okay. feel so much better. I think I'm actually allergic to coffee, but I won't admit it, or at least oh. sensitive. Yeah, I don't feel great. But you know what I, I noticed? The matcha gives me a little bit of uh, um, nausea. Hmm. I think everybody's different, depending what kind. So I got some gr- good quality organic matcha. I, I brew- So what I did was I did one bag of green tea. It's a nice flavored green tea, like cinnamon or something. Okay. And I added a scoop of matcha and I did a scoop of MCT Co. Uh, powder. It was like heaven. It was okay. great. Hot? So, yeah, I did hot. I like okay. hot in the morning. Yeah, I like yeah. hot too. Yeah. Um, there's, I gotta, I'm going to bring some for you. Keto Farms has, uh, there's this little company that... They have um, snacks, everything's organic, and they have like, you know, it's like dried fruit with nuts and stuff, and they have... How is that keto? <laughs> it's... What is it called? Keto Farm, right? Yeah, Keto, keto farms. farms. It's more like, to me, it's more paleo than keto, yeah, huh. yeah. but it's still pretty, it's low carb. Right. But their matcha, they have a keto matcha, which is like instant matcha with MCT powder in it and stuff like that mm-hmm. in packets, which you really yeah, like. Yeah, I always wonder about instant matcha because so any like MCT powder has to be plated on something to instantize it, right? Yeah. So what are they what are they plating it on? Uh, I know? have to find out. Find out. I, th- I know that it's it's a very small list of ingredients, mm-hmm. so it's probably like a some sort of fiber. I gotta see. Right, that's the best thing about MCT co MCT powder that I love. Right. So yeah. I did a video recently on Instagram where I just stirred it with a, a cold, ice cold cold brew and I stirred it with a spoon and it dissolved uh, with a fork and it dissolved that's perfect. Yeah. Like, it's no amazing pumps. whereas if you buy these other ones it's no, they chunk up. terrible and yeah. you, have, you need a blender and I'm like ah, I gave you remember we had one the other day at the Arnold yeah, it was terrible <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um, I want to introduce our guest you guys have heard his voice already but mm-hmm. this week's guest is someone who's made a huge impact on my life on Mauda's life and on our children's lives he's someone we look to for guidance and inspiration he embodies what we mean when we say surround yourself with people who challenge you to be, be the best version of you. And as an IFBB pro bodybuilder, this is the part he's not going to like because I'm going to be talking about his bodybuilding No, that's stuff. okay, man. That's okay. part of who I am. Okay. Uh, he won the 2008 Mr. Canada competition. He finished a second twice in 2008, and he placed second in the Arnold Classic competition in 2013 after a fourth place finish in 2012 and a tenth place finish in 2011. Two more top 10 finishes in 2014 and 2015, and in the 2012 Mr. Olympia contest, his first ever, he finished 11th. For the past several years, he's provided some of the best information on how to live your greatest life in your greatest body with the Muscle Expert podcast, and more recently, the Muscle Intelligence podcast. He's a dedicated father and husband, and one of my best friends on this earth. Please welcome... Ben Pakulski. What's up, brother? Thanks, man. That was a great <laughs> intro, and I appreciate you doing all that research, because I'm sure that wasn't that all that easy, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not ashamed of being a bodybuilder, man. I think it was, I loved it. And actually, somebody asked me a really interesting question yesterday, like, about um, the obsession of bodybuilding. So this this guy reached out to me on Instagram and said, hey, man, I'm doing a PhD on uh, physique obsession. And I was like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. I don't think I was obsessed with my physique. I think I was obsessed with the process and I know that's one of your questions today yes. I was obsessed with the process of becoming the best bodybuilder I could and maybe being the best in the world but I wasn't obsessed with the physical appearance of it and that's just so they actually had some good reflection on on this whole bodybuilding journey yesterday um but I, I love it man like I, it made me a better person there's no question like I needed that in my life right I needed to become a great bodybuilder to overcome my insecurities to overcome my fear 
and also I needed it to allow me to realize that's not what I want in my life or not what I need in my life. Yeah. Right. right. You know, and people have to go through that journey in life. Sometimes you have to accumulate those things, whether it be uh, money or uh, material goods or whatever relationships sometimes yes. to realize that you don't need any of those things to make you happy. What you really need is to make yourself happy. And that comes from within. So that was my greatest blessing, man. So I definitely don't want to renounce my past. Yeah. And, and I Robert, that. I learned this with Robert, our good friend, Robert, who you haven't met yet, mm -hmm. that when I learned about bodybuilding from that perspective, it, it, I looked at it a whole different, mm -hmm. a whole different way because you know, the, the fact that all of this is, um, you're doing it without being forced to do it and the things that you put yourself through yeah. that's the part of bodybuilding that I think my is biggest awesome. insecurity or my biggest pain as as a youth as a child was that i identified as being extremely lazy and extremely fearful and i hated that and i was like why am i so lazy why am i so fearful why is everything so hard for me so obviously you know with the personality i have i chose like the polar opposite sport and i was like well how do we find something that just allows me to work as hard as I possibly can. So that now that became a superpower rather than a weakness. Um, so it's an interesting thing, man. Like every single day you get to go in there and test your laziness and your discipline and your, oh, yeah. your resolve and your persistence. And I, I have nothing bad to, to say about my bodybuilding career, nor do I have anything bad to say about bodybuilding, right? Everybody yeah. does it for their own reason and everybody's on their own journey, man. And yeah. I'll never condemn someone for the reason they do it. If it, even if it's for vanity, like if you're doing it for vanity, yeah. there's a reason you're doing it. And hopefully at some point in your life, you're as blessed as me to realize that, oh, that's not, the end result isn't the, isn't the goal, right? Yeah. The process is the goal. So and uh, I was just blessed, man. Like I found that early because, you know, a lot of people go through it for a long time yeah. thinking yeah. like, oh, I'm just going to achieve this and I'm just going to get make this money and I'm just going to build this muscle. And then right. you're like, OK, well, a lot of people then what's after that? The thing exactly. is, you reach that height pretty quickly, too. Yeah. So you were able to. That's why I say I'm that. blessed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and reaching a goal is a blessing and a curse, right? Because you reach it and you're like, oh, we're amazing. And then literally instant later, you're like. Now what? Now what? Mm -hmm. So I do this with a lot of my clients, right? I, I have them set, you know, mentorship clients. I have them set a 25-year plan. And people go, what? Like, how am I going to set a 25-year plan? Well, there's a reason for it, right? I call it a 25-year vista. rather than It's not like a view because like it's like the long-term right. view, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens when, you know, let's, let's say for you guys, 10 years from now, you've got all your financial goals. You've got your homes. You've got your cars. You've got the business you want. Your kids are in college. You're flourishing. What after? Yeah. Right. What's next? I think people do. Would you say people are they don't go as hard at that because in the back of their mind, they're afraid of what's going to happen when they when they get there? Sure. They, they don't even think they're going to achieve what's first. Right. So right. but but what, let's say all those things that you that you want to achieve in 10 years are done. We've got them like we've got the house. We've got the money. The bank accounts padded. Now what? What do you do then? And for me, it's it. There's there's almost two options. Right. You're either going to help people. Or are you going to go on some internal spiritual journey or both? Right. Right. And that's all that's left. And I think that's an important realization for everyone to have is like create that 25 year plan or maybe it's a 40 year plan, whatever. Right? Who knows how long we're going to live? But knowing those end objectives allows you to focus on the bigger picture rather than the menial like, hey, I need to make 100 grand this year. I need to make a million bucks this year whatever. Like, that's great. Those are going to happen anyways. Mm -hmm. What's next? Right, because then I can I can know what my true values are. So for me, like speaking about the topic of this podcast, it's kids, man, like mine and others. Because yeah. I had such a challenging childhood, um, it really allows me to to uh, relate and hopefully help. You know, and again, the irony of some sometimes it's a blessing and a curse to want to help everybody, but um, I think that's a big part of my future is putting together a foundation, putting together a business where like somehow I can empower little kids with the knowledge and the belief in themselves to go through and live a life that they've crafted. Cause dude, if you would have told me when I was a kid that I would have achieved anything, I would have doubted it. Cause yeah. I, you know, I talk about it this morning actually with Jordan. I was saying like, man, I had a pretty traumatic childhood. Like I was, you know, a very fearful kid. I stuttered because I was so afraid. Um, you know, I was completely asleep from a perspective of like all I did was watch TV and eat Doritos and it was very unhealthy. And it's true, man, it was very yeah. unhealthy. Um, you know, didn't do much. And, and like to, to say that, you know, you've evolved now to be an educator and have a successful business and a, and a great family and amazing children. Um, 
fuck, like, yeah. <laughs> c- couldn't say anything. Like, I, I'm so happy. My, my, all my dreams are fulfilled, right? Now this, the rest of my life is just a bonus, yeah. right? Yeah. So now how do we create even bigger dreams that, you know, we can achieve in this lifetime? Love that. I love that. And I love what you said about, like, not just helping your kids, like, help others. Because oh. that's how I feel. Like, when I go into those homeschool groups sometimes, I'm like... Who am I helping today? You know, I, I wish kids... it was acceptable to like hug everybody. I know, <laughs> I know it's not, know. but like some of these kids just need love, man. Yeah, they just need I, attention. Yeah, like they really, and that's why they like me. Because yeah, I go attention. in there and I really am curious about who they are and who and like what they like, you know, because I know individuality. that individuality, yeah, their individuality. Because oh, yeah. just like you, like I didn't get that, you know, right. I always felt weird and she felt just like... not understood, and so yeah. I just. Ignored like she everything. had to be someone else. I was also lazy, yeah, and and yeah, just pretending to be someone else. All People the time. always go, oh, "Do you do you want your son to be a bodybuilder?" And I'm just like, "I hope not. Like, yeah. I hope he's whatever the hell he wants to be. I hope he doesn't follow in my shoes. If he so chooses to, right. I'll support him right. in every way. But I hope he just like whatever." fills his heart right and that's the only conversation i ever have is like do you love this then do it and if you don't then don't, then don't. you know he, he tells uh, tells me every day he loves hockey but i don't think he does like oh he, we go through that too yeah. through he's still that. at that age where he wants to please, he wants they to want please to you. you yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, sweetheart, if you don't like it let's do something else right. like so he, daddy can we play hockey i'm like sure i grew up playing hockey right when we get to hockey like he, he has no passion on the ice i'm like dude if you, like he, he's great at it there's any passion I'm like, if you don't love it don't do it man don't make it doesn't make me happy yeah like make, if it doesn't make you happy then what the hell are we doing so anyways and if they're passionate it. it really shows because that's sure. something that I always like tell Danny or I'm like no one ever had to tell me to be early um to be on time to dance class because right. I would tell my mom I'm like we need to go now right. like we have to go I can't be on time is late and I need to be a part of this whole thing and, yeah you know and that's when you have that like when you know what you want you can see the passion there. It's and, true. And you guys, I mean, you're around my daughter enough. You see her passion. Like, she's that one, right? Yeah. Like, hey, mom, can we go early? Daddy, can we go early? My son, like, hasn't found it yet. That's okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I didn't find it until I was in my <laughs> mid-20s, maybe, yeah. right? So i will find it. And, yeah. and, and for yeah. parents listening, just, like, try not to steer so much, right? Try right. Just, just to, to support. Right. You know, observe. be there to catch them when they fall or, right. or be there to tell them that you love them and that they're adequate and observe. Yeah, observe. like facilitate, right? Like, yes. oh, I see yes. you're interested in that. Let's go do that. But but don't don't guide, man. Like, yeah. at the end of the day, I mean, uh, again, both of all of us probably didn't have parents who were aware of this and we ended up okay. So I think no matter what, your yeah. kids are going to end up okay. But um, if you can facilitate it early and develop a passion, and uh, talk about this too, like with this homeschooling thing, all I'm there to do is allow, is teach them to learn, teach them to think, yep. and allow them to explore. That's I it. I like know. I think well, homeschooling is amazing, right? Like all I want to do is make you great thinkers. Right. That's all. Yeah. You'll, That's figure, the you'll goal. figure out the rest. I don't need to teach you math. Like no. great, we'll do math. But yeah. Yeah. I'll teach you to think. That's why people, awesome. people, we're always confused because people are like. Well, what are her credentials? What are my credentials? Or what's the curriculum? Yeah, what's the curriculum? It doesn't matter or because we're, we're not, if he needs whatever he needs, I'm going to find the expert. Your you credentials know, are love. Yep. And if you love someone, you will want what's best for them. Exactly. That is all that matters, I believe. I agree. Right? I agree. We agree completely. There, there agree. may be levels to that that people can disagree with, but, um, you know, just because you love someone doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do everything oh, that's course. best for them. But, yeah. Right. Um, but I think you knowing you guys, like at you're like, base, okay, yeah. I'm not great at this, but let's go find someone who is, like you just said. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Love it. Well, this is going to be redundant, but go ahead and ask All it because right, well, it's what we always start right. with. Yeah. All right, Ben. So, what is the most critical problem that you're currently trying to solve? I have no idea. I know it's such a hard <laughs> one. And it's uh, so no, many. It's true, but the, the reality is this could this could go so on nice. for an hour. Um, the most critical problem I'm trying to solve in, in my family, in my business, in myself, in the world, like. Yeah. Hmm. That's that's a pondering one, right? Yeah. Um, most critical problem. Uh, so, oftentimes, um, you know, the idea of be the change you want to see in the world. And if there's something that I need to do better, um, it's it, and I've been much better over the last two years since retiring from a bodybuilder. It's self reflection to allow me to change the person I am so that I can change the world around me. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the problem I'm trying to see it, to change with myself is never being reactive and always being responsive. So that's one that's important. And we talked about that briefly before 
was like, I don't ever want to react to my kids. I don't want to ever react to my wife. I want to be in, in control of who I am. And for me, that defines mindfulness, right? People say, why do you meditate? Or why do you, why do, you yeah. do this? What is this mindfulness thing? Yeah. Well, the ability to choose your response, you know, rather than react and rather than getting angry and getting upset and allowing external circumstances to determine who you are inside, how do you determine who you are inside and, and then portray that on the world, right? Yeah. So either the world's going to shape you or you're going to shape your world. And, and that's what meditation is for me. It's like taking that 10 to 30 minutes in the morning to create my mind before the world creates it for me. And I think even with my kids, I, like anytime I'm home, which is maybe half the time, I'll sit down as soon as they wake up and I'll sit them in my lap. And first of all, we're going to do five to 10 breaths. And then it's having them just create a thought. That allows their thought to carry that into the day. Anyways, so that's big for me. Is that That's a big problem, if, if you want to call it that, I'm trying to solve. Is I think that's the only way you can create your world, right? Is the yeah. ability to, to mindfully craft it. Yeah. Um, and if we want to get you know, bigger and esoteric, uh, my, my change in the world is, is that. You know, yeah. making people become more mindful. And it's not even of what they do well yeah i guess it is it's like how they impact others you know like right. hey man why are you consuming all these things you don't need to why are you not taking care of your people around your family and your loved ones why are you destroying the environment like to walk down the road and see the plastic and see the oh, I know. pollution it's and so see, it's just like how does someone not think yeah. Like you, you're on you're on the highway. You see the side of the highway. Like who still throws shit out their window? Yeah. It's oh, 2019. It makes me so angry. Like, fuck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. We yeah, went no, to, no, no. no, it's okay. Yeah. We went to we have our, a community pool, and I was enraged because community I pool. go out there in Bags my own community, of, of fast food. a brand new community that you would think that the reason you bought into this community with your money that you worked hard for, so you could have a nice place. It's a brand new pool that they have built, and there's like plates with like food that someone left there. And of course, now there's an ant problem, you know, mm -hmm. where our kids are getting bit by ants. I'm just like, who leaves this here? I don't... Yeah, and again, we, yeah. we live in the world that we live in, right? And right. We, we, you know, you live inside your own little box. And yeah. yeah. There's people out there who just don't think they they, don't. and they don't care about it. And, and I think it's it'll always be the reality. And if we let it stress us out, it, it you know, you're right. fighting a battle that you, right. know, you can't win. But uh, it, it's unfortunate, but it is what it is, right? And, and that's why I think, you know, the more we can continue to spread the message of just like sit down and spend five minutes by yourself alone with your thoughts and, and then try to control your responsiveness and pay attention to the way you feel and pay attention to the amount of tension in your body. If you can alleviate those things, well, now we can start paying attention to not only your words, but your actions and, and you know, the actions of those around you. Yeah. And uh, I think that if, if anything is a, um, you know, a, Big, a big quote unquote problem I'm trying to fix in the world is just trying to encourage my community, which, you know, I have this unique ability to influence this small demographic of people. Right. Like, let's do that. Well, how about we start a day like that so we can just be better people? Yeah. You know, and if it's the bodybuilding world that I can influence or the entire fitness community or, you know, my goal is just, you know, Danny, I talk about this all the time. How do we just lead men to be better dads, to be better yeah. men? Uh, and, and I don't think I'm perfect by any stretch. I've got many, <laughs> many, many hills I'm climbing. We're all human. Yeah. But um, like, how do we just leverage this amazing platform we've got and this unique opportunity to, uh, if we can help men be thoughtful once today, we win, right? Like if we can prevent you from throwing one thing out your window or yelling at your child yeah. or yelling at your wife or whatever, and again, not perfect, but thoughtful of it, right? right. And, and again, so everyone has an idea, this is an accumulative thing throughout the day. So if you're constantly letting stress build up and build up and build up and build up, eventually you're going to snap, right? It's tension and, and that's being built in the band. So being aware of how much tension is being is, is accumulating in the band throughout the day. And then if you're feeling that tension building up, whether it be in your muscles or in your mind or in the ringing in your ears or the, the noise around you being too much, take three to five minutes, sit down, slow down and breathe yeah. and realize you are in control of your ability to bring the tension down. Your ability, you have the ability to bring the, the mind tension down, the mind chatter. You can bring that yeah. down and it's not hard. It just takes practice, right? I, I say this to my kids every day. They're like, dad, that's hard. Nothing in life is hard. Nothing. Literally nothing. I love it. It just takes practice. Yes. You just haven't practiced enough yet. Nothing. Meditation is hard. No, it's not. Everything is hard Every, if you haven't done it yet. Right. right. You just have to it, practice. It's always hard the first time. Right. But how about the 50th time? Exactly. Right. How about the 10th time? So I think that's a powerful lesson for parents, for the kids. Check their words. It's not hard. I can't. I, I, you know, I like try. Oh, I try. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, We're no, trying no. to eliminate that right to. now. No, 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 no. You right? get to. Yeah, yeah, right? Like paying attention to that stuff and, and allowing your kids the opportunity to 
um, become mindful of their words and actions is is beautiful. Yeah. And and really, like that is how you change the world, especially totally. as parents. Like, how do we change the world? I mean, how much more beneficial would this have been if we learned this as yeah. children? You know, like yeah. I'm learning this now as an adult, right. having to, you know, but especially with our kids in the like technology in this world that they're going to grow up in that's so busy kind of they need it yep. more, more than ever yep. more than we did you know yep. and that mindfulness that you talk about so it important. extends into the part every step along the way so when you when you when you do that stop or when you respond versus reacting or when you practice gratitude i think the next step is like pay attention to how you feel physically because a lot of people don't get to that part and when I'm like wow I physically feel amazing right now I just practice gratitude for like 15 minutes you feel this rush right and physically yeah. you changing your body that's powerful yeah. so powerful and just so like powerful. stress stress does the same thing it manifests itself physically, physically. yeah so the speaking of gratitude practice right for some people that's challenging so uh, usually you can find one or two things at least where you actually feel grateful for you right. know like I wake up every morning and my children are often very close or beside me and like, how can you not be like right. overwhelmed with the internal actual feeling? So it's not just a thought, right? It's like a nervous system yeah. tone that exists in my body. And I feel that. And then I start, ex so that's like the bullseye, right? That's the closest to me. That's the circle. And then I start extending that circle out. And I, and I then create associations in my brain with all the things that are around me. And then I build my circle. And you guys are both in my gratitude practice every single morning. Because I'm so blessed to have amazing people like you in my life. Feel the same, right? feel the same. And literally, so you just build a circle, right? And eventually the circle becomes so big that your life is, is engulfed by this circle of gratitude. And it's like, oh, I can only feel this feeling now. Like, I can't feel anything else. It's That's true. an amazing place to be. But so for people who have never done this... I start with those one or two things mm -hmm. that are so close to you that you're like, oh my God, I'm so grateful for that. No matter what it is, like figure it out and feel the feeling and then reproduce it as the circle grows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It could even be, I was this morning focusing on, on experiences that have, I, I look back at the experience and I'm so grateful for it. And then trying to feel the, the feelings that I felt then, like watching it like a movie, right. smelling the smells, yeah. all of that. And that's what meditation yeah. is, right? Yeah. 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 Reproducing it in your body and then taking that into the world. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. That's right. a great point, man. Thank you for bringing that up. The idea of like people just don't pay attention to their body. Yeah. You know, like I, this morning, strangely, actually, I think it was after um, our, our session yesterday we did with that new biohacking piece we got. Oh, yeah. I felt this strange, like almost anxiousness. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. I haven't felt that in a while. But observing it allowed me to, to be aware of it and change it. Right. So I have like, oh, so I have a little anxiety in the pit of my stomach. And I was like, OK, I haven't felt that in a while. How do I move this? So now I can actually be aware of it and I can breathe or I can exercise or I can move and I can mobilize it thinking about, you know, evolutionarily our bodies have evolved to once we feel stress we see the line in the room or we see something that somebody's coming to kill us we're either going to fight we them or we're going to run right. we, move. we move so okay how do we move this right how do i create a little bit of motion even if it's like some simple uh, breathing technique or reaching above your hands like above your head like do something and i was able to move it and it was gone you know rather than living with it letting it build and not realizing it's there pay attention to myself like i'm feeling my body and now i feel like i'm in control of my ability to change my emotions because a lot of people feel disempowered right i don't know if i can do that like, i'm always overwhelmed i'm always a victim okay well overcoming the victim mentality starts with paying attention yeah. starts with realizing you can change realizing you can take control and, and no matter what it takes for you to get out of it it's not a deficiency in prozac it's not a deficiency in some pill <laughs> right. it's like hey you actually your body built to fix that shit like yeah. like yeah. Think about it. Right. And listen, man, I, the reason I feel comfortable talking about this stuff is because I come from a world of pain. I come from yeah. a world of fear. I come from like the most terrible explosive tempers and alcoholism and drugs. And like I came from that. So I live that stuff. I live the fear. I live the anxiety. I live the pain. Yeah. So realizing if someone had given me a skill set when I was seven, I'm like, hey, like, come over here. Let's breathe. Like, close your eyes and realize everything's going to be okay. And I've gone through some interesting shit where I went back and like talked to the seven year old version of myself that saw some crazy stuff. And I was like, Hey man, yeah. it's going to be okay in my mind. And then you're going back and for whatever reason that, that sounds weird, but it sounds, you know, like, Ooh, but it works. Like I no, feel better. Works, that, that was closed yeah. in a, in a, in a, in a final way where you were able to, yeah, you can rewrite right, that man. chapter. Oh, you're going to be all right. And you change your stored memory. Like, you know, if you've ever done NLP, NLP will typically store something that's negative, like in a black and black and white, and the picture will be small, it'll be far away, it'll be in a box. Yeah. So you can change it, make it bright, make, move, make it move faster. 
and change the way your brain stores information and uh, you can completely change your association with that event mm -hmm. again that's getting deep people need to talk about that stuff but if anyone has like some deep events that they want to remove yeah. go see someone who's an NLP practitioner it's, it's important stuff like because you store these things in your nervous system you don't even know they're there like yeah. I've got so many things that were blocked from my childhood that until I went and saw like mm -hmm. someone who like help you bring these out I didn't know they were there my sister would be like hey you don't remember that I'm like not at all yeah I remember what <laughs> like yeah, yeah this happened this happened it. this happened I had no idea. Yeah. And fear. And your brain does that on purpose. It's an evolutionary thing, right? If you're always you. if you're always living in fear, you wouldn't get very far. But um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm so grateful to be alive. I see this every day and people think I'm out of my mind. It's a freaking great time to be alive. Yeah. And you and I, we're all blessed to be able yeah. to talk to people. Yeah who are amazing we're really doing amazing so lucky things. to be able to talk ah, to these people man. it's a selfish i tell people they're like how do you do the podcast thing and i'm like it's the most selfish thing i do because i'm just like I learning so just much oh, dude i talk to people every week and i'm like these people are changing the world like yeah like oh yeah cancer no that's not a thing anymore like what <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> like yeah. what? Like yeah. literally everything. And, and yeah. this idea of like you can you can create love in your body. You can you can. Ah oh man, it's it. I'm just. I think it's amazing. I'm excited yeah. to be alive every day. Yeah, yeah. That's well, awesome. we share that. Um, we want to go back to this because we talked about this already. The the difference between being goal oriented and process oriented. Sure. And you've spoken about your evolution from that first to that second approach. I went through the same thing, um, and how it's shaped you currently. Um, can you share this process with our listeners and like what are the possible downfalls if you're only focusing on the outcome versus the process? Yeah. Um, well, I, you know, giving my story is the best place to start is, is at 17 years old. I had some uh, desire to become a bodybuilder. And I, I bought my first, actually, the funny story is I bought my first, I didn't buy my first, I saw my first Flex magazine at 15. And I was like, ew, that's disgusting. Why would anyone want to look like that? Yeah, you, I think you wanted to be like men's health, right? That's it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, then I got health. the men's health body relatively quickly. And, and uh, I was like, oh, well, what's next? You know, so right. then I started buying, because, you know, like, I just want to be 170 with abs. Or it's like, and then I just want to be 180 with abs. And then I want to be 200 with abs. And then eventually it's like, yeah. you know, what's next? It's this, this, <laughs> right. anyways. Originally, I was like, okay, let's become a bodybuilder and I was like I didn't know if I wanted to go all the way or whatever so I'm like, I, I like bodybuilding let's bodybuild and I, I like I never told anyone I was a bodybuilder like until I was well into my competitive career as a bodybuilder I never told anyone I was a bodybuilder I was just a guy who loved to train I loved the process of training um, and eventually there was a point where everyone's like hey man you know you could be the best in the world I was like oh okay like it's kind of like thanks that sounds great uh, and once I set that goal um, it, it changed my it changed the way I looked at it. Like I was now chasing a goal. I was now chasing an external right. goal rather than loving the every day of like, hey, I'm just a dude who loves to train hard. Now I was chasing this goal of being, you know, one of the top bodybuilders in the world. And it kind of changed the, my love for it. I started to lose the passion a little bit and, and I was pursuing something outside of me and, and I didn't feel the same degree of, you know, joy when I went to the gym. It was more like a, I have to, like I'm, I'm going job. after, yeah, it was a job. a job. So, you know, I, I ascend this proverbial mountain and I get to what, what most people would say is pretty high up in the mountain, uh, you know, made to top 10 in the world, stay, stay, there, stay there for a few years and was probably willing or was probably able to, to push to the top of the, the sport, um, but just realized that it was an empty thing. Like I, I got, you know, second place at the Arnold, which is the second biggest show in the world. I got, you know, top 10, like I said, and I realized that the closer I got to the contest, the bigger I got, the leaner I got, the more insecure I was, the more fearful I became, the more I knew people were judging me, the less confident I was. And it was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, why is that? So it just allowed me to realize that that wasn't the fulfilling end result that I thought it would be. You know, everyone thinks like, oh, I'm going to get the muscle or I'm going to get the girl, I'm going to get the car, I'm going to get the money and I'm going to feel better. Yeah. And one didn't do any of those things. You know, I got to the Olympia stage and that was a great accomplishment, but you know, it, it was as soon as you walk off, you're like, well, ne what's next? It's kind of like what I say to the kids with toys. I goes, you know, sweetheart, I bought you that car that you really wanted. And then 10 minutes later, you weren't playing with it and you wanted the next car. So it made you happy, right? Well, yeah, it made me happy. Well, for how long? Well, maybe a minute. Once I had it, I didn't need it anymore. I didn't want it anymore. So did you really want it? Or you just thought it was going to make you happy? So that's the same with every fleeting goal, right? Oh, yeah. Like, oh, well, we're just always chasing the next material thing. That's that. And that's going back to the gratitude. That's that lack mentality versus that process Abundance. mentality. Because you're, you're lacking something. There's something that I have to be something. I have to get something, right? Yeah. So getting to the top, like I said, was... was um, it was empty for me. Like I really enjoyed it. I loved it. I loved the person that I ultimately became, but it also was just, 
you know, not what I thought it was going to be. So I'm very blessed to have ascended the top of that uh, mountain quickly and not spent a lot of years. Because I know there's a lot of guys and girls spending a lot of time, a lot of time, time. Uh, trying to, to chase goals that are maybe not going to fulfill them the way they hope. Right. Um, so, it, you know, that's kind of where I am now with this, this idea of this realization of enjoy every step of the way. So there's another good story that I'll tell you in 30 seconds. Last year I was climbing a mountain and, uh, the day before the mountain, my ego's like, this is going to be really hard. Like, I was like, oh my God, this is going to suck. I'm going up with two guys who are very good friends. They're both very fit. Uh, you know, one guy does like ultra marathons, 100, 100 mile. Yeah, Alex, yeah. <laughs> Alex, yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, well, and the day before, I literally almost quit. I was almost like, I can't go, man. I'm, I was just going to be so painful. And I was like, oh, no, you're not going to quit. You're going to go. You're here. I went to California to do it. Climbing the mountain. I get to the bottom of that, and I look up, and I'm like, this is going to suck. And I just kept telling myself, this is going to suck. This is going to suck. The first hour was the most painful experience of my life. Yeah. So the reason I was telling it was going to suck, my podcast manager's behind him laughing, because the first time we did it, Alex undersold us. He goes, oh, it'd be easy. Well, we did nine hours, and maybe more. And it was like the most painful nine hours. Like, it sucked. <laughs> it sucked. Um, so then this next time I was like dreading it. My mind's like, oh my gosh, this is going to suck. And then I got an hour in, this is going to be about six and a half, seven hours up and then three hours back or something. Um, and I got an hour in and I, and I looked around and I'm in California. I was with two of my best friends in the world. I'm like, man, what are you complaining about? Yeah. Like you're outside, you're on this beautiful mountain. You don't have a cell phone. You have no stress in the world. You can be here right now. You get to be here right now. Enjoy it. Right. And at that moment, like it took probably, you know, a couple minutes, mm-hmm. but all of a sudden all the pain in my legs, all the burning in my legs went away. All the discomfort went away. I felt better. My energy felt better. My, the, it was easier to breathe. It wasn't it literally like I floated up the rest of the way because I just started to look around and appreciate the moment. And when I did that, literally, it was like this instant change. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, isn't that the best metaphor for life? Like, stop for a second, breathe, look around and appreciate what's around you. Appreciate the people that are around you. And all of a sudden, life just gets a little bit better. It gets a little more beautiful, and it gets a little less challenging. Yeah. And the, I literally feel like I floated up the mountain the rest of the way. Like, it was so easy, you know? Awesome. Oh, it was amazing. And that's the best metaphor for life is yeah, appreciate what you got right now. Yeah, and, and uh, things just get better. Love it. I love that attitude is everything. That's how I am when, like, um, people are, will tell me. Like, my mom will tell me, I'm getting sick. I'm like, no, you're not. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. mom, this is literally why I don't get sick because I never believe that I'm sick. Right. I'm like, you will make yourself sick. I promise. Well, I've kind of like decoded the whole sickness thing too, right? Like I've, it's yeah, an I energetic to, thing. I don't get sick. Yeah, it's an energetic thing. And, you, and when you think it, you're bringing your energy levels down. Yeah. And there's there's levels there, right? There's there's things that have to happen for your body to get sick. Yeah. Are you predisposed to sickness? Maybe. Maybe. But it doesn't mean it needs to happen. Right. So if you bring your energy back up in whatever, you can actually di- define the science behind that. Mm-hmm. Like you can bring your energy back up and overcome oh, yeah, it, right? So, so and it's that. literally just the negative charge of the cells. So the more negative the charge, the better. You, you need a negative charge of your cells. So if, you, if the negative charge of the cell starts to drop off, you, you start to lose this structured water that encompasses the cell, and you're more likely to being sick. So how do you keep your thoughts? Sense. How do you keep your thoughts in, in such a high vibration that the, the energy in the cell can stay negatively charged, which allows your body to transmit ele- uh, electricity throughout it and, and keep this structured water? So the simplest solution is get outside and get some sun keep mm-hmm. positive energy ground yep. with the earth get, you know like simple stuff eat good food yeah and and literally there's like documenting walking yes. through these processes that's all you need to do and yeah. you just can't get sick i know right? i love it that's what i do she i'm like does. let's go outside. or like if the kids like they're you know looks like they might come down to something i'm like all right let's go outside let's go in the sa- now we got that sauna so forget it i'm like Plug go in the, the sauna yeah exactly yep we're not getting sick it's not yeah, happening so we've got the nano v here right which is this tech piece that i've, I've loved for like the last two years and it's just inhaling structured water which is you know, yeah so you're literally inhaling a negative charge so if you ever feel like you're getting sick you jump in the sauna you do it you know nice. you do a workout yeah you're workout good. you're good you're good i know love i love it. it all right well one of the things our listeners will be interested in is how your dietary approach has evolved so you came from the bodybuilding world and were traditionally higher carb how does that differ from the way you eat now and what can you share about the benefits of a lower carb higher fat approach with respect to overall health cognitive performance and of course building muscle yeah um (laughs) so as a bodybuilder i ate how i knew right Right. or how everyone before me had eaten and i believe that really high carb was how you're going to grow and i always felt like crap 
always, 100% of the time, my energy was low. Going to the gym was like, ah, oh, I gotta get a coffee, I gotta get a caffeine. I always felt like crap. I was always inflamed. My brain was always like slow, I had brain fog 100% of the time. It's terrible, it's a terrible existence. I didn't realize there was anything else. It was a terrible existence. And then when I finally started to, to discover low carb was toward the end of my career, I actually went low carb for quite a few years toward the end of my career. It felt amazing. Nice. I was yeah. like, gosh, what the heck? You yeah. know, my energy's better. Like everyone's like, dude, how do you train so hard with low carb? I'm like, I just feel good, man. Yeah. You guys don't know. I was like struggling for yeah. the last 10 years and I got good at that. This is like cake. This is easy. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a big transition for me. Once I discovered a lower carb diet, which is honestly 2000. Seven was the first time I ever did a ketogenic diet. It's nice. a long time ago. Um, after that, again, I did it reluctantly. I was like, no right. way, this is not going to work because I was just of the belief like you need to That was during a prep, right? During a prep, yeah, yeah. for wow. 2007 um, North Americans. Nice. Um, so, again, that was my, kind of my first exposure to it, and I was so reluctant. I was like, there's no way this is going to work. And, again, I didn't, that didn't feel good because yeah. my brain was like, oh, this is not going to work. Uh, and again, tried again in 2011, um, just because I was like, I need to drop my carbs down to get in shape. And I did that for about six weeks and I felt amazing. It's like, oh, that's interesting. So after that, every year I would do a low carb period. Nice. And then I, by that point, I mean, my education by that point was, was growing, accumulating right. every year. So I started to understand the benefits of lower carb dieting, inflammation, on brain focus and stuff. Um, but you know, evolving past bodybuilding. So I, I think, and Danny and I talk about this all the time, I think that to, to build mus maximum muscle, carbohydrates are, you need it. Do you need as much as I eat? No. Right. You need as much as you need to fuel maximum performance. I think that's a paradigm shift for people is most people will design a diet and then make their training fit that. I think it has to go the other way. I think you have to design your training and make your diet fit that. Love right? It. So okay. if, I, if I'm training hard and I know today is going to be a really hard, high volume, two hour leg workout, well, doing low carb doesn't make a lot of sense because right. I need the carbs to fuel that workout or I, I don't need, I want the carbs to fuel that workout, right? right? It's going to allow me to perform harder. Yeah. So if my objective is building muscle, eat to fuel a workout, eat to fuel athletic performance, right? So that's the way I build workouts now. Um, whereas now my focus is shifting away from building, you know, right. insane amounts of muscle. Right. And now the focus being, I need cognitive function. I need all the energy. I need energy for my kids. I need, you know, be able to write and, and run a business. Yeah. Well, focus is your number one yeah. the objective. Mental clarity. It's unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It is. It's unbelievable. And it doesn't have to be like zero carbs or 50 carbs or less. Like no. even with 150, 200 it carbs, for if you're insulin sensitive, yeah. if you're, it if you're, for all things being equal, I still feel when it's paleo even that my cognitive performance is, is there. I think... You know, speaking again, we haven't talked about this, but like one fasting is massive. I yeah. think if you're going to, if you want brain function, you fast sometimes, you never mm -hmm. fast all the time, but sometimes yeah. be hungry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and being in a caloric deficit, I think is, is kind of how you ensure your body is going to function optimally. If you're in a caloric excess, especially if it's come from carbohydrates, you're going to feel more of a brain fog, I think just across the board. So, yeah. so I think there may be a necessity in doing, you know, maybe one day a week or one day every couple of weeks in a high, in a caloric excess for hormones. Maybe it's two or three days in a row in caloric excess and then coming back down into a deficit, right? So you're kind of resetting yourself. Think of how we would have eaten evolutionarily, like feast, famine, feast, famine, mm -hmm. you know? And I don't know if you need to eat 10,000 calories a day, but just above caloric baseline. And maybe, you know, if my baseline is 3,200 calories, maybe for three days I eat 35, 3,800, and then come back down and eat 2,500 every day. I think that has worked well for me lately. So I intentionally, went about once a week for me, because I'm still training three or four times a week, I'll have over my BMR. The rest of the week is below what, what I would say is my daily caloric expenditure. Uh, and as far as diet, like uh, we talked about how simple we keep it, right? And I think people yeah. have, have talked about huge. You know, varying so huge. food is so mm -hmm. simple. Sensor specific satiety, that's a huge thing, right? <laughs> yeah, you taught me the word hyperpalatable foods and I was like, man, why hasn't anybody said that to me before? Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, don't give your, give your kids or yourself hyperpalatable, hyperpalatable foods. foods. Yeah. yeah, And that's what we do to, definitely to kids, like Doritos. For example, oh, man. that's engineered not a natural foods. flavor. That's like no. engineered. They're like, yeah. I, I picture them like Their connecting going, it to oh. someone's brain. Like, oh yeah, that's the response we want. Let's go with that. You know? And that's a real thing. You know? Like it feels criminal. Almost like, all foods are engineered. Like <laughs> having designed now protein bar, the level of, of thought and, and manipulation that you can put into these things. Oh yeah. Everyone's doing it because it's the difference between selling the bar and not selling the bar. Yep. Like yeah, people don't want real good, food. They want something to taste good. They want something to I'm taste like, good. Okay. So you can, you can, I mean, even when you manipulate a bar that's got great ingredients, there's still a level of manipulation of like, hey, this mouthfeel isn't right. We have to like put it on the back of the tongue and in front of the tongue. And I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, it's a science. Yeah. It's a sure. science, man. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
so yeah, I, I guess that kind of begins to answer the question of, of what I'm eating now. And um, so just quickly to, to wrap that up, um, the, the foods that I think me and I really agree on, um, wild meat, right? It's, yeah. it's wild meat, it's, it's wild fish. I'm eating a lot of fish right now, so I'm, I'm going through a unique diet shift. Uh, I eat green vegetables, so, you know, if we may or may not agree on that, but like any type <laughs> of green vegetables, um, berries. So berries is a big thing for me, I eat a lot of berries. Yeah. Um, I like my berries olive too. Olive oil, and uh, mostly olive oil, not olives. Uh, avocados, coconut oil, and we talked about chocolate and coffee and, that, and maybe green tea on that list now, right? Yeah. That's like eight things. You're like, yeah. that's it, yes, that's yeah. it. And and sometimes when I have my high carbs, I'll do like sweet potatoes and tubers. Mm -hmm. That sounds like uh, our diet. It's literally it, right? <laughs> literally. So, what yeah. else do we eat? People are uh, always asking me like, what do I eat? I'm like, if I, I don't even post my food because it's like the same things every day, you know? People yeah, don't understand, but, but it's not, but, that, but it's not but really there's boring. there's beauty in that, right? There's yeah, beauty in that because like, you look at, see that. They you look see at Jocko that. Willink, 4.30. 4.30, 4.30, And everybody goes, why do you post your phone every day? Or your, your picture you watch every day? Because I'm showing you what matters. And that yeah. may be why. The discipline, it's the little things oh, every day. People don't understand people that. people say, man, how do you eat well on the road? I mean, what do you mean? You how do we eat about? well on the road? I just eat how do we the same well things Danny? all the time. Well, we either don't eat. Right. You either or, don't eat. Or we get an Airbnb and we go find and a butcher. And we get food. We cook our own food. It takes yeah. five minutes. Like, the way and we, we eat literally takes five minutes. We were, we were eating ground, what was it? Liver I saw it. I was yeah, like, liver I heart it. and ground. Yeah, so on delicious. vacation. Amazing. Delicious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, but it's so hard yeah. to eat when you're on the road. No, it's not. No, it's not. <laughs> and people don't realize, like, to me, well, like, even with the carnivore thing, like, even if it's not carnivore, like, so simple. Because I'll do avocados and chocolate. But, like, those sure. are my four foods. Like, I'm like, Macadamia chocolate. Macadamia butter. Macadamia butter. Yeah. F meat and fish, you know? Yeah. But it also takes that decision-making thing out. Like, decision fatigue is a real thing. I'm like, no I don't, I love that I don't have to ever waste time thinking mm -hmm. about what I'm going to eat. And that's a huge thing. Like, Steve Jobs, Obama, all these people, they would wear the same, same outfits clothes. every day. And yep. that's what I do, too. I, I'm yep. like... Danny probably loves that part of me being his wife. Yeah, like I not wasteful, that's hate, for sure. I hate, well, I also just hate shopping. Like I would rather <laughs> do anything else but shop. And like, so I have like my uniform. I'm like, I'm either gonna wear yoga pants or jeans and a shirt. Like, I don't want to think about it. Jeans. Mm -hmm. Jeans, yeah. yeah more yoga Maybe if it's super fancy. Yeah, same here with the jeans. <laughs> that's, that's the beauty, though, it's right? Because like, you, you yeah. know that your husband loves you. You have no one left to impress. You love yourself. And what the hell else matters? I know. What do I like, need? Like, who are you trying to impress? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, like, <laughs> who fucking cares? We're like, in the you know, same. There's one person in the world you need to impress. I wear, right like, when we go out to you. eat, I wear my nice yoga pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I think it's important to, to be for me to appreciate what you've built too. That's why I talked about that the other day. You're like, so annoying. If you're building this booty, <laughs> how am I not gonna touch it? Like that would be a crime. He's so ridiculous. For for the, all the hard work she's put in, why should- Dude, love that body, man. You have to, <laughs> yeah, I told her that the other day. Why not? <laughs> right. If not, what, why not, you know? Yeah. That's true. <laughs> all right, Let's so there's a thing that you've taught me with training that it's just been, huge on my mind lately and it's it's this whole focusing on the wrong things the same as before there's a skill acquisition that goes into the lifting and I, I'd like for you to go specific to muscle building you talk about a progression yeah. from skill acquisition to getting the highest quality contractions which is something like I said I've learned a lot about uh, with you if someone who's, I'm someone who's trying to add the most amount of muscle how should I approach it from a skill scam standpoint and then going to my exercise volume load selection how, how does that progression go so that people sure. can know what to focus so on? so it's it's great because i just finished writing about this for the program we're doing together oh, so yeah. it's it just yeah right about it so but that's literally the piece right so everybody in in the fitness world for the last 25 and 30 years focuses on progressive overload okay. and they focus on manipulating reps and sets and load and volume and those things are very important but what you're missing that that has to precede all that is the standardization of the stimulus so what does that mean every rep needs to be equated it needs to be the same right so you need to be able to quantify the stimulus before you can sorry you need to be able to qualify the stimulus before you quantify the stimulus the quality of every rep needs to be identical otherwise how can i determine that say if i say dan i need you to do three sets of eight well, if every one of those eight reps looks different, how do I know you did three sets of eight? How do I know how much you did? Oh, so like so next week, here we're gonna do four sets of eight. How much did you actually do? I don't know. So that's a piece everyone's missing. So everyone's like, oh man, I did four sets of six. What do they look like, right? What muscles were actually doing the work? Because it's important to realize that your body's designed to cheat. Your body's designed evolutionarily to be as efficient as possible, which means I'm gonna use as many muscles as I possibly can. Right. If you want to build muscle, it's the polar opposite. opposite. You need to be as in inefficient as possible. 
meaning one muscle works, not all of them, right? Mm -hmm. Defining efficiency. So how do we know that the muscle I'm training is actually doing the greatest amount of work? This is the missing piece in fitness, man. Like if you can't build muscle, it's nothing to want. There's, there's many facets, right? I mean, I could talk about those too. But the, the biggest missing piece for everybody who's, you know, quote unquote, working hard, trying to build muscle is they're not working hard on the right things. They're barking up the wrong tree, right? Yeah. They're like, if, if your trainer or your fitness celebrity says, hey man, you need to work harder. They're full of shit. It's yeah. not about hard work, no, yeah. right? Because hard work That's only makes sense. That's people to hear too, right? Oh, dude, smarter. but hard work is only only useful if it, if it is preceded by smart, right? Right. Smart, work smart first, and then you can work hard, and it makes sense. So that's the big missing piece. And and um, if people want to understand how to do that, it's just literally like learning what the, what the mechanical setup is for you because you and I are built differently. We're all built differently. Yes. So if you're watching someone on social media or on YouTube yes. going, hey, man, that, so that person's got great arms. He does it this way. He's got great legs. She's got a great butt. Well, but what if they're different than you, right? What if what if they're different? So it's so important. And, you know, we all, when we do chest or we do legs, we're all sitting up doing different things, like different width on squats, different, you know, it has to be different. And that is, if anyone's having a hard time building their body, make sure that yourself or your trainer is identifying what works for you. And just because a trainer says, hey, this is the way you do it, doesn't always mean that's the case, right? It's unfortunate. Uh, I'm doing my best to spread the message and spread the knowledge, but... Um, you know, there's, there's a very small handful of people in the world who actually understand that. And to be honest, like even myself up till very recently, maybe like two or three or four years ago, like I didn't, I got it, but not to the level that I think is necessary to simplify this stuff because it's necessary. It's important to realize this is actually really, really simple. Building muscle is really simple. It's not complicated. It's really simple. But the piece that everyone's missing is exactly that, right? They're missing the standardization of the stimulus. So once you've done that, okay, well, let how do we so this idea of skill acquisition we acquire the skill of exercise realizing that if i'm going in the gym if i'm going to play basketball i'm not going to try to play a game of basketball without learning how to dribble right. probably with both hands maybe learning how to pass learn how to shoot at the free throw learn how to shoot a three-pointer those are important um beyond that so those are my skills those those are what's necessary to play the game well in fitness how many skills have people focused on acquiring before they try to build muscle well none right none. people just go in and i'm just going to work hard we're kind of what? Like yeah. driving the car faster without a steering wheel is not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, right? it's true. Like you need a steering wheel. So don't apply more gas until you learn to steer this damn thing. So that's the skill acquisition piece. And then once we've got skill acquisition, the fastest way to acquire a skill is by doing greater amount of frequency and a greater amount of repetition, right? We want to do things over and over and over again. So when I start a skill acquisition phase, it's probably sets of 15 to 20 reps. Not a lot of volume, very low volume, but I can do it often. I probably can do it three, four, five times a week sometimes if I'm trying to learn a new skill, right? So the best example I give, if someone, if you, if you write with your right hand or converse with your left hand, you're going to switch hands and I want you to write your name. Okay. First time, what's it going to feel like? Incredibly awkward, very slow, very messy. Well, what if you did it every day? repeated it yeah. first it's gonna be slow eventually you can go faster eventually you get to the point where you don't have to think about it you do it who thinks about writing their name on your sign you do it it's built in your nervous system that's called unconscious competence so I, I don't have to think about it unconscious I can do it competence so that's what we have to aim for right so how quickly can we get to unconscious competence and, and what can we do to hack our, our skill acquisition phase so this learning phase like how can we accelerate it you know, and, and that means being healthy, have a healthy nervous system, eat well, and there's some other stuff within that you can do. But that, that's really this skill acquisition piece that everyone's missing. And it doesn't have to be long. It's different for everybody, depending on your health and your sleep and your nervous system and environment and all these things. But th anywhere between three and six weeks to learn a new skill for most people, right? Six weeks is about right. So I write six-week primer programs. So I talk about like, hey, if you want to learn how to train back, well, here's a back primer. If you want to learn how to train legs, here's a leg primer. Um, so that's how I teach it. And... and uh, there's, there's a few people in the world who are really, really good at this, like way better than me, but no one in the fitness industry, right? The people, like very few. So if anyone wants to learn how to master this, if you're a trainer or someone wants to master it, you can, one, come here to our place or our camps, which are all around the world now, or two, go to uh, RTS, uh, Tom Purvis, Resistance Training Specialist. Tom is by far the best educator on the planet at this. He blows me out of the water. He's amazing. It's funny because he's always talking about Tom Purvis and I'm always talking about him. <laughs> Cause I, I, I think you're that guy. Maybe because I don't know him as well as yeah, you. Yeah, Tom Tom's just next level brilliant. And, and honestly, like taught me everything I know, man. Like yeah. Yeah, like I've obviously put a lot of the pieces together. My unique con contribution to this is I worked harder than anyone in in, in this space, right? Like mm -hmm. that was the only thing I had when mm -hmm. I was young. Like yeah. I just I I made sure that anybody that came to work with me 
knew that I was going to work them under the table. Right. That's the only thing I had. So when you combine knowledge and work, you push, you're pushing the boundaries, right? You're, you're kind of pushing the level of where you think things are going to break. And you see what breaks and what doesn't break and what works and what doesn't work. And that's what I, that's the unique contribution I have. And, you know, I, I kind of made that my calling card when I would train with me. I like, I'm going to ensure that you leave here knowing that you trained with me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love that. Uh, and that is the thing. Everybody knows when they come to MI4, yeah, yeah. they're going to work. And it was 10 times worse when it was in my career, right? Because I, I had an egocentric uh, attachment to making sure that when I walked on stage with you, you were going to know that I whipped your ass. Like, there, Well, because there's power in that, right? Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. power in that. Like, if I'm competing with you, like, I, I wasn't friends with anyone I competed with because of that. Yeah. Like, I can't, right? I, they're nice guys, whatever, but I need you to know that I'm better than you because yeah. <laughs> right. bodybuilding is a big psychological game right oh, for sure. the difference of inches like am i standing tall or am i slouching just a little bit and the judges unconsciously pick that stuff up so anyone anytime i got a chance to train with one of these guys i always would and you know it, it never kind of mounted to me being mr olympia although i think if i pursued it further and wanted to i could have but again anybody says speculative that i could have been the best but uh, i think you know it just it never came to that but every time i stepped on stage with someone i competed with it was obvious like you can see it Awesome. I love that. Okay, well, we've covered some of the topics that our listeners are interested in, but now it's time for us to move on to things that get us all excited and get us out of bed every day. So what excites you nowadays after your pro bodybuilding career? Spend time with my kids. It's the, o- it's the only answer. I know. Uh, I know. And, and people go, you know, tell me that, like the time when you were most happy or you got most excited about your kids. I'm like, every day, man. Like, every day I get to see those amazing faces. It just lights up my heart, lights up my life. And there's so much, um, like, they have so much potential, too. So oh, it's, like, oh, yeah, it's more exciting. It, I just want to love them i just want them to be fulfilled and happy and know that they're they're enough um but yeah my kids are everything and and i'm trying to no, i shouldn't say that word I'm, I'm creating a life now that allows me to um spend more time with my kids and learn and those are kind of my two things yeah. um so if i can create a life that allows me to create enough passive income to be able to learn and read eight to hour, eight to ten hours a day and yeah. spend the time when i'm not learning and reading with my kids I'm fulfilled. So how do I craft that? Right. That's what I'm yeah. kind of reverse engineering in my mind now. Yeah. Um, so with this learning and educate, learning and educating myself comes learning and educating other people. And that's the only thing I feel fulfilled with is like, I have this amazing platform and uh, this incredible passion to help people. So now how do I leverage that into, okay, I need to spend more time learning and putting together pieces. If I have one gift, quote unquote gift, it's seeing things that don't necessarily connect and looking at how they connect. Um, yeah. So like looking at all the pieces uh, that are yeah, that are together. Yeah. Oh, that, that that's how this works together, and that that ultimately maybe makes a useful entrepreneurial mind because you're yeah. connecting the dots. Um, so that's maybe where I am now is um, learning and, and and spending time with my angels. I love it. And that could be you know the thing is that uh, you know I'm on the same page as you, and I think a lot of people are just they get they they maybe want that, but they get so preoccupied with that other part which is the creating the passive income, creating the income. And I think well, you have to like it. You have to, but I just, yeah. I think maybe they, it's the focus is off because they're, it's always right. Everything looks right in front of so you. So I had a really, so I, I always never talk about, I always talk about awareness. So I'm like, sometimes you sit down in meditation. Sometimes during the day you have these things that come into your mind. And some people yeah. say, I had this thought. I'm like, I don't think it's a thought. I think it's an awareness. And my awareness this morning was, I saw this man, I was, I was just sitting down doing some work at Oxford exchange this morning. And I saw this man walk in and he's there every day. And if you've been there before, you know who he is. And he's there every day and he walks in very well dressed man like perfectly groomed great hair like sweet suit awesome shoes no idea who he is don't never talk to him but it made, made me think about something it made me ha- have this awareness around like okay what does that guy do right so clearly he's financially independent um and he's walking to this place and he's able to go here sometimes he reads the newspaper sometimes he just drinks his coffee and he sits there and thinks and he's probably 50 52 and, and i'm like okay what is that guy doing so this idea of thinking versus doing and this is a unique thought right like people who succeed in life think a lot more than they do right the idea of like if i'm going to chop down a tree i'm going to you know spend 90 percent of the time sharpening my axe and just a little bit of time cutting down the tree i think that is where we we all get caught up is spending a lot of time doing and not enough time thinking um so you know, uh, the best shifts in my life have happened when I've put my phone down, put my computer away and disconnected from the world and allowed myself some time to have clarity and vision. And all of a sudden you come back, it's like, bang, 
now I know exactly what to do. So we a lot of, we spend a lot of time meandering aimlessly on things, doing things that are not contributing to our greatest purpose, our highest mission. So if anyone listening, like disconnect, you know, at least once a week, I think you started doing that. You said like Sundays or something, you guys disconnect. Well, on Sundays, yeah, the phone is down the whole day on Sundays. And, and then even just night. the simple thing of like no TV at oh, night. Oh, yeah. We're and doing yoga. Doing that. Ben has been doing that like, for a while. Yeah. But you just, we, we. You get more creative and you do. You spend more time together. Like right. being outside. Go for a walk. Yeah. yeah. We go for our night walks yeah. now that the sun is out it's longer. A, Australia was massive for me. Like just being removed from the day to day BS. Yeah. Like, you, oh, like you come in the monotony and you, you do the same things unconsciously. Like it's like yeah. then you go back to your parents' house. Yeah. Right? Like what do you do? You do the same thing you did last time you were there 20 years ago yeah (laughs) same thing you did when you were in high school same thing i'm like why am i looking like that like the junk drawer and they have like i'm like why am i doing this stuff like it's it's mindless right because your brain is that's that's, right so if you go to a new environment and you've you know you're detached and you're in some place that's maybe allows you to just be free and be relaxed you can think so the greatest book of all time think and think and grow rich right oh, yeah. uh, what's like his name? Napoleon, Napoleon Hill, Napoleon Hill yeah. like that is the that's the thing that started the self-help journey right he spent 30 years researching the smartest people of the time and asked for all their success habits and it's the exact same thing everybody's teaching now nobody's reinventing it it's all the same stuff like it's like oh it's all just regurgitated Napoleon Hill like yep pretty much so Napoleon Hill's amazing like if in the book is think and grow rich it's not do and grow rich it's think and that's the big piece man and it took me a long time to learn that (laughs) yeah Um, Yeah. I'm not a quick learner but um, that's it like you need to carve think time and if it's you know that's what my meditation time is in the morning right it's like spend 10 to 15 minutes setting your uh, conscious state setting my state of mind setting my internal energy and then spend 15 to 30 minutes after that thinking think suspect like i'll close my eyes and i'll stretch and i'll move but i'll just be sitting there like pondering amongst my mission and usually you'll set an intention like what am i trying to get clarity on today is it business is it relationships is it uh, my big mission in life what is it right set that intention what i want to think about and then just let your brain go your brain will figure it out and and you'll have some inspiring thought they're like i have to take action on this so then you break up the journal you write it down always write don't like type and uh that's I think how breakthroughs happen. You know, I've been getting so much clarity lately with what I want to do in my life and what mission and impact I want to have on this world and it's just from that. It all kind of shifted for me last May actually. I went on I mean it was June. I went on a five day retreat in, in Lake Tahoe. Nice. And uh, I had my computer and stuff, but I was by myself for five days and uh, with other people, but I had like my own wing to the house. It was the most I was like, God, I need to do this. Every, I need this every amazing. month. Every month. <laughs> like, sounds amazing. But you would make me. 10 times as much yeah. money. There's no question. You'd make 10 times as much money because just spending that time alone, getting, first you're going to get the superficial thoughts of the way, like I'm hungry, I'm itchy, I'm going to go work out. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Okay, now those things are done. Now what? Oh, now I have to actually think of things yeah. that are important. Right. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a, it's a, you know, a shifting paradigm for me that I'm working to implement into my life. I kind of already do it, but working to make it more regimented. Like the last five, five days of the month, I'm gone, you know? Love yeah, it. I love that. So now with the parenthood thing, you know, it's obvious it's our it's our biggest responsibility. It's our biggest passion, all of us. Um, I'd like to go into a few of the, and, and this is gonna be a hard one because there's so many that I can think of the top of my head, so many that you've recommended to me. But what are a few resources that people can really, that, that people can look to to change their thinking on parenting and to, to kind of help them understand a different way than than what they are used to sure I, man i think you and i talked about this too I, I think there's a bit of an irony in that question and i believe that the best way to become a better parent is to first become a better person and yeah. so people 100%. are often reading parenting books and like wait a minute what you don't have to don't worry about your children yet yeah. Like, let's worry about you first. Yeah. Right? Because that's what those parenting books are going to say. Oh, yeah. That's what they say to Laura Markham, which is one of our favorites. Every time I read her book. Dr. Shefali. Oh, she's the best. Yeah. Shefali. That that book is amazing. It's always the same. It's like, well, wait. Start with yourself. Well, one of my favorite quotes that really made it resonate with me was, your children hear zero of what you say and see 100% of what you do. Yep. And I'm like, that's so true. Oh, your biggest mirror. <laughs> so true. Yeah, when she said the thing about the mirror in that they book, Dr. Shefali said, that's the one that stuck with me the most. Yep. You know, you know I, I was very blessed uh, as early as 2007 to have a life coach who eventually evolved into being one of my best friends in the world um, say exactly that to me. He goes, man, because I think my when my son was my wife was pregnant she's like man I'll tell you what 
they're just a mirror of you. If there's something that you're not doing well, it's going to show you right there. And like, oh, I didn't. So at the time, like you was talking to his kids, he got four kids. And I was like, I, I, now I get it, man. I'm like, you're so right. Like, you know, if, if you're short with them, if you're not That's patient true. with them, if you don't love, like, it's right there. Yeah. So resources, man, my, my favorite resources, um, Dr. Shefali, by far. Dr. Yeah, Shefali, she's great. Um, and you guys need to connect with her. Like, well, yeah, yeah. I, I, we we really yeah, want to get her on. Her. So she like... just started doing relationship stuff. So like, I wanted to get her on my podcast, but I'm like, she's not really going to want to come on the Muscle Intelligence podcast. But relationship stuff is relevant because relationship is is a huge part of having a great life. Yeah. You know, so I didn't want to get her on for parenting stuff, even though I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to get her on for for um, relationship stuff first, and then I'll get you. You guys see. Well, by the way, we'll connect you with her so you can you can get her on the great. show. Love that. Yeah, yeah we amazing, love right? her. I, but we love wouldn't her. it be better to go to like one of her events and actually connect right oh, oh absolutely. yeah absolutely yeah. this idea of getting people on podcasts without actually like I know, connecting I know. it's okay but like yeah i want to go and meet you and hug you and like learn from you and that, yeah. that's my right. yeah but still i mean even the the, the recommendation and the name because i have people texting me someone texted me yesterday a picture of the book which one of the, the awakened family yeah the second one and i'm just like I'm just goosebumps, you know, because this person is about to embark on a journey in that book. Totally. Because especially for us, I mean, Latin people, and I don't know about others, but I know for our experiences, it was a whole different paradigm, you know, so it's like... It's just common to be Being like, awakened wow. to that to that style and to that mode of thinking is something that's so empowering for parents, and it just... It's a way of life that fills you with so much love, you know, because yeah. you're not... The, the other way is, is, is like the struggle and dealing with my kids and how do I get my kids to do that this that blows and my mind you see yeah. what she said that really stood out to me like in her book was how all of my reactions are fear based like totally because of my fear that my son mm-hmm. is not going to come out like or let's someone say, like, else for is going to judge you for being a bad parent oh right. yeah that's uh-huh. a big one <laughs> yeah someone else is going to judge me but for me it's more like that they're not going to be ready or something you know yeah. like ready uh, I'm so far past that now like yeah. because this homeschooling thing has actually been a huge help yeah uh, like people are like oh, how are you sure they're going to stay up with the curriculum I'm like, like I'm not what curriculum like I'm not well I'm not how concerned. do you know you're doing a good job the only thing that I'm attached to is am I creating great human beings who can think that's yeah. it. Like, I don't care if they can do three people plus three. Yeah, They'll learn that so shit. Much, they will learn They'll it. learn it so fast. Like, are they great people? Because that's so, like, so much more important. Listen, I know people who are 30 years old. Actually, I can think of some good examples who are, who are in their 30s and they're brilliant, but they're fucking assholes. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, man. Yeah. Sorry, my language. No, it's fine. I, I, I agree. I, if my kid turned out to be a complete numbskull, but he was a loving, she was a loving, amazing human being. I, I, I win. That. I win. Yeah. I'm like, I don't care if you. I don't care if you ever go to high school. I don't yeah. care if you ever go to first grade. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. Like, be a wonderful human being, I know. and you will. Like, you'll find your passion. So, again, <laughs> I, I, funny story about me. Like, I did not read a book until I was 16 years old. Like, I, I went through high school and I passed high school, and I never read a book. Like, people are like, what? I'm like, I didn't read a book. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? I didn't read a book until I was like in my mid 20s. I went to university. I didn't read books. Like yeah. I got through school, doing enough to get by, enough, and that yeah. was it. And that's not an exaggeration. <laughs> but so <coughs> graduated with honors too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever. I got honors. And I did point anything. being, <laughs> point being, I didn't find my passion until I was thirty. And now that I did, people are like, hey, man, you're so smart. I'm like, I'm not smart. I just love what I do. So it's not a job for me to get up every day. People right. be like, how, how do you work so much? Like, I get up at 4, I go to bed at 10, and every day, every minute I'm moving, I'm learning, I'm engaging. I'm like, how do you do that? You just do because you, like you love it. You so love how it. do you get your kids to find that? Because if they can find that by the time they're 10 exactly. or 15, and that's the they key. take over the world. Yeah. The whole that's world. The <laughs> that's, such, that's the key. That's the key for the, us. And the other side of it with, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's the okay. other side with the becoming a good human, and we've talked about this. I don't know if you've had a chance to see the, the John Taylor Gatto. I've watched videos. a lot of it. He's got a He's lot of stuff. So uh, so, He's so good. He's amazing. Know, where he talks about harvard and princeton and what they're trying what they to look for. find you know mm-hmm. and what ceos are looking for they want to they want to know can they have a beer with you can they have a meal with you totally you know and that's what i'm looking they at lo- they right. look at the hobbies they want to know well, what you do during yeah, your free and time my business is a great example a right like the yeah. first my first team like i hired based on skills zero still remaining now i hire based on personality like are you a good person do i want to hang out with you if not what the hell is it worth like i don't want to make money and be around assholes exactly. i don't want that yeah that's terrible it's stressful yeah yeah because you're bringing more stress in my life exactly <laughs> yeah. has anyone ever swore on your show before on your show before 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. We have Robbie, Chris, Robbie, was, Robbie, our friend Robbie. We had to literally put a disclaimer. Uh, but it was we didn't edit it because the story. No, it would take away from the story. You know? It was you know the addiction and everything. Yeah. And so. Yeah. Life wild. is not life is not clean sometimes. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I always say if people get offended by my words, it says more about them than it says about me. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Just my last thought on that. Um, well, I guess we're going to, it's a good segue anyway, so we can talk about it. Um, well, many of the, de the, the decisions that we make, especially with respect to education, are shaped by our own experiences. For example, I felt like so much of my time was wasted um, during school years doing everything that I didn't want to do. And so I got burnt out. I did, hated learning. Um, and that's not what I wanted for the kids. So how about you? Like, how was your experience? How has that shaped how you approach education now? And I know we talked about it, but you know, getting, you know, deeper into that. Yeah. Um, I didn't like school. I didn't like anything about it. Um, even, even going, so the only reason I went to university, to be honest, it, actually, strangely in first year high school, I was in a high school that was close to where my grand my grandparents lived, so I lived with my grandparents. And I just knew that being in that school, nobody was going to university. Nobody. Canada, sorry. University, not college. <laughs> yeah, university. Semantics. It's okay, we're used to it. We're like obsessed with Canadians. Right. You know, we like, are, we so love Canadians. So in, ten, in, in tenth grade, I switched into a different school that was closer to where my dad lived, knowing that it had a higher academic standing. I don't know why I had that awareness as a kid. Every single person in my high school went to university. So that's the only reason I went because I would have been like, oh, I would have felt left out. So I had to get yeah. good enough grades to get in, into university. Um, but if it wasn't for that, I would have never gone to university. Right. Um, but I didn't until until I was in university did I like anything to do with school, right? Like I was always good at math. I was good at, good at little stuff, mm -hmm. but I hated it. I just literally like, hey, man, how'd you get enough to get by? I, I just like, I did enough. I had a great smile. <laughs> I was really nice to people. Like teachers were like, do what I need to do. That was oh, it. Oh, yeah. Um, so this this idea of forcing kids into different topics and, and forcing them to sit there and, um, you know, stand in line and cross their fingers and sit up straight. And I'm like, what? The bells. Like, oh, man. Like, yeah, the bells. Yeah. And so, you know, what was sort of the breaking point for me? My kids went to a very first year of school. They went to a very, very uh, expensive private school. And um, wa letting them, watching them walk between class. And they had to touch their shoulder to the wall as they walked like to the next class. And I was like, what is this? I'm like, we're out of here, man. Yeah. <laughs> we're out of we here. Go. So that was a big thing. I never liked that about school either. Um, so that was, that was a big influence on me. And the big thing you realize is um, parent, teachers are, are there to make money. They're not always there because they want to be. And I always just said, like, I just want my kids to be around good people more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so to be around myself and my wife, I think, is and people like you, is maybe more valuable than learning any amount of curriculum in school. I, um, I think that's, you know, kids learn by, by observation. They don't necessarily learn by looking in books. So that's a big thing. So how do we, how do we get them to learn by experience and go to different countries and be around great people? And I intentionally, very intentionally surround myself with very limited numbers of great people. Uh, and I feel like that's their greatest lesson in life is they're going to look at you, Danny, and they're going to look at you, Mara, and they're going to go, they're really great people. I want to be like that. Yeah. That's the biggest learning lesson, I think. Yeah. 100%. So. Yeah. And also schools, like being there until you're 18, it kind of extends childhood. Oh, and that's something that, that, oh, that's yeah. something that John Taylor Gatto talks about, that it's an extension of childhood. Hmm. Because, I mean, school is actually a relatively new concept. That's what people don't understand. I'm like, I'm like guys, 100 years, years ago, people were not school, yeah. schooled, you know? Um, you know? Ben Franklin, all if these people, they had like up something. and running businesses by the time they were 12. You know, 13. 13 years old. And hmm. now we have 18-year-olds raising their hands to go to the bathroom. Sure. And then two weeks later, now you're an adult. And it's like, now, now, what do I do? now, yeah. you, know, what now do? you have to decide and everything. It's interesting. And also, like, you know, so having a 12-year-old son, um, he, like, he actually brings up some really unique ideas sometimes. But the idea of allowing him to start a business is, like... He did, he's like, oh, I'm telling him in high school, I'm, I'm not going to start a business. I was like, interesting. So you almost like you, you put um, governors on them, right? Like you yeah, can't do good. anything until you're done school because you got to go to school from 8 to 3 every day or right. whatever. Yeah. That's an interesting thought that I never really considered. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big or thing. Or like arbitrary ages where mm -hmm. you Yeah. It's yeah. kind of yeah. like going, having to go to work, right? Like, well, I can't start a business. I have to go to work. Right. Yeah. Oh, well, how about if you didn't have to do that? Like, I guarantee my, like Presley with her pet sitting business, like, I guarantee my kids will have businesses. If we don't homeschool by the time they're 12, I guarantee they will. Because they're, oh, yeah. they're always like, I need to make money. Well, how do you make money? 
go start a job. Go exactly. start a job. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's more of like, like an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. Entrepreneurial and like creating, creating things like not having to, because when, when you're forced into that one route, the, the options are so limited, you know, like it's go work for someone, go study this, go do this versus what do I love? Who do, who am I? What do I love? And what can I offer that's unique? And then just start from there. When it when Desmond was five or four, it was dream catchers, getting sticks, painting the YMCA, painting, painting the sticks, turning them into dream catchers. He's he's made like three hundred bucks. He bought himself a bearded dragon, you know, wow. and the terrarium and everything. And so like you know that continues on. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is we we try to create practices, um, not only habits. But, you know, the environment, all the things that we eat and all that. So I'd like for you to share some of the things that you do. And to the extent you're comfortable, talk a little bit about everything from even nutrition and supplementation. Because I know there's a few things that we both do that with our kids that, that not many people do. Uh, because, again, they treat them like they're these different things that, they're, that are not human. Like they're not the same species. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then activities. Um, and, and it's they're like taboo. Like people don't either that taboo or the, or the people think maybe because they're kids, we got to wait till later to do that. What are the, some of the things that you do? Not only from a standpoint of becoming the best human, mm -hmm. but also the the, the built-in um, hard hardships and, and challenges. Yeah. <laughs> um. It's interesting because, it, you know, it's thinking on the spot, you know, not having really thought about that. It seems to be very, um, so there, there's certain things in, in that I implement into, into my life and their life that are consistent, right? And, and for the kids, it's very important to me that they have a regiment. They have some, they have some degree of consistency. So every day from nine to noon, we teach. And Amanda, to be honest, teaches most of the time right now. And, and there was a time where I was doing about every other day. And Lately, it's just been a lot of her, um, but I love to be there for them because I, I love to let them experience different education styles. So my education style is very much guided by them. Um, so like I'll ask questions and I'll say, what do you want to learn about today? And what do you want to talk about? And wherever it seems like whatever they're passionate about, we go that down that path. But so every day we learn from nine to noon and um, it's not, you know, other than them having to journal um, about what they're grateful for or what they did the day before or you know, something simply just again practice writing practice getting your thoughts out we give them you know 20 to 30 minutes to journal other than that it's very much um responsive and reactive to what we're doing so we get this amazing opportunity to travel a lot we get this amazing opportunity to uh, experience great people like yourselves and if we t if we talk about something if you guys bring something up to me then that can sometimes guide their education um, so that's you know giving them regiment is important but the first thing we do uh, as soon as they wake up is we walk you know, so we call it zero hour walk. When I got that from the military, from our buddy, Kurt, um, just like get outside and walk. And, and this idea of bilateral movement, walking and running is imperative in the development of their minds and development of their brains. Um, so it's massive as well as getting sunshine in their face in the morning. Yeah. Uh, we get home and, and often we'll do like, you know, minimum five breaths. That's it. Like sit down, do five breaths. They're kids. I don't expect them to sit there for an hour. Um, so five breaths and just making them aware of their body, making them aware of like trying to relax their body. And do you feel anything in your body? What do you feel? Where do you feel? And asking questions and often just sit them in my lap and say, you know, like I want, I want them to feel my belly breathing into their back kind of stuff. Like I want them to kind of be in sync with me, make them feel safe, make yeah. them feel comfortable. And then I can also kind of feel where their tension is in their body so I can judge and like, oh, they're moving this. So oh, hey, oh, you know, just whisper, relax and relax this, relax your legs, relax your shoulders. Um, and just the idea of uh, anytime. So what I'm doing there is um, I'm just training the, the ability to sit down and slow down five breaths. So, I mean, usually I extend it to 10, but you know, that works. <laughs> but so the ability to sit down and not move for 10 breaths for any human being is, is valuable. So what I'm doing is I'm training that skill so that if, if at any time in the day they are having a hard moment or they're, they're acting out or whatever it is, it's like, Hey guys, let, let's take, 10 breaths right. so now they know how to do that so we've built that skill yes. so they can go sit down and calm themselves down and it's, Those are tools it's the most diffusing them. thing that any parent can do right so rather than a punishment it's like hey 10 breaths and you know give them something to think about or, or not just like hey can you go and just control your breath for me and like belly breaths the big difference so that's usually how I'll diffuse the situation is especially if I, Amanda doesn't always keep up with it but when I'm there they do it 100% of the time um, and you know that's 
a very useful skill for a parent or a tool for a parent to have rather than going, you know, yelling at them or sending them right. to the room or punishing them or taking something away. It's like, hey, go sit over there and do 10 breaths. And then it just diffuses anything. That's so that's big. Um, as far as um, other things I do that are unique, um, I don't know. That, you know, we, we try to we try to keep the the reading as a consistency. They read thirty minutes every day, and they get to choose what they read. Um, is there something that comes like you? It seemed like you had like a, a, a well, specific I was example. Of the, the other things, like some of the other stuff, like the Alpha GPC. And oh, stuff. Something, <laughs> sure, man. Yeah, we do that. We do that. Yeah, <laughs> they, uh, well, they call it the sugar stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, supplement wise, they get vitamin D every day. They get fish oils. My kids are so weird. You guys, I think yours are the same. They like to eat the fish oils. Like they think it's like Dean loves candy. the fish oil. Yeah, yeah I don't even like it. Desmond doesn't like the the. Oh, the fish oil. But, like, like, but the, give him the, the pill. The pill but the Desmond pills, yeah. can take Dean any pill, so oil. it's perfect. But does he swallow the pills? He'll swallow My kids chew the pills. pills. They love it. He, they chew it? They chew it. They That's love it. That's hilarious. Dean likes it. Likes the taste of the Dean oil. Dean likes the oil. oil like the flavored one. Strawberry. It's strawberry, but it still tastes like... Yeah, because right. I've From, tried it. Uh, I have some here. I'll give you guys. It's really oh, good. Nice. Okay. Okay, cool. I actually like the taste. It's a little sweet, but kids will like it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that Alpha GPC is um, just a choline donor. So like my my son doesn't like eggs, so my daughter eats eggs. So I don't have to give it to her. But like choline is very important in the development of brains. Mm -hmm. um, I give them creatine, which is a, a bit taboo. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I, I might one. start that one. So since yeah. they were six months yeah. old, since they since they were six months old, I was putting the baby formula. That's true. No, it's not about muscle. It's about nervous system. Yeah. So people associate creatine with the nervous with the, with muscles that show up with the nervous system. So it's it's yes. imperative in the development of the nervous system. So in adults too, like every every human being should be taking creatine. creatine again. We have it. The only thing is that the one that I had had like other stuff in it. That's why I stopped. I have, I have yeah, you had like a regular one. I'll take that. Okay. Yeah. So I'll make sure I have this list on the fridge. And usually Amanda doesn't do any of it, but I, I <laughs> <laughs> uh, collagen. Collagen is another big one. I do right? So because we eat so much um, uh, animal protein, it's important to have some collagen. Um, what's that put in there? Um, I'll sometimes give them cod liver oil, just kind of mix it in for some vitamin A, um, vitamin C, I think that's it, but um, I can't think of anything else that stands out that I give them that's consistent. Yeah, that's that's it. Those, those things. Those are the key ones. Uh, people uh, are, we do bees. And, and, we do methyl bees. Ah, yes, so important. And especially because some people, we definitely have the genetic mutation. Yeah, we have it. We both are, are heterozygous, so. So they have it for sure. And I'm homozygous for the B12, B12 one. Yeah. So I basically, yeah. yeah. And so then you may need a special so type of B12, right? There's a hydroxyl type of B12 that you may need for higher absorption. Yes, yes. That's on the pure genomics report mm -hmm. that I... I should probably start experimenting with that one because the methyl B12, I feel like, isn't really cutting it. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. That, so that's and one it's not for sure for, for parents. Methyl, methyl A, B12. Thank yeah. you for reminding me of that one. That's and see, B vitamins. Yeah, yeah with Dean, um, if we give him the second B12, methyl B12, around what time does he get it? Like 3 p.m. or 2 p.m.? Like midday. Midday, not too late. And we don't give it all at once because it's a hyperactivity thing. But but if we give them that one, there's a little bit of an increase, but maybe because it's not that version, it's still not enough. So that's interesting. I see the opposite of my kids. If they're getting like anxious or, or amped up, I give them B12, they calm down. Really? Yeah, completely. Okay. Yeah, if a little I see them getting like irritable, I, I'll give them B12. They chill out. That's interesting. Yeah. It's I'll just, do GABA sometimes. Do you really? With the kids? Oh, yeah. yeah. Like Allie Miller's GABA calm? Oh. I'll just do one, though. It's just a chewable. It's a chewable? It has a little bit of, uh, of xylitol, and that's about it. But that's good, yeah. We all we all strategically take that one at times. Right. When there's Things you don't want to take it all the time. Yeah. Do you guys do story time? Uh, we talk about that. Like, like, like I read stories. them books. Yeah. But then some. The only person who really into like me just creating a story out of thin air is Dean. Yeah. Desmond would rather me read him a book. Right. You know, because Dean, Dean is like he he, he loves seeing my my just creativity come out. Yeah, but I always tell him it's real. <laughs> That's, awesome. That's awesome. Yeah, you should do that. Yeah. Yeah. Real, he'll be and, and sometimes I'll just end it and be like, you guys have to come back tomorrow to hear the rest. Oh, that is so good. good. I'm like, Daddy, can you tell us your story? What yeah. happened? And I'm like, are you sure? And like, you know, it's just like, hang. <laughs> this is this perpetual story that can kind of go on forever. I mean, it, it, it forces my creativity. Yeah. Yes, it's good for you too, right? Totally. And, and allows them, and eventually at the end of it, they're like, yeah, I just made that up. But it, you can guide it, right? So it can be about them. It can be about something they're into at that moment. It can be like, 
you know, when it's, when it's my daughter Presley, it's always about like the pink princess in the in the forest or something. <laughs> Do or, it. You know, picking mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> or it's my son will be, uh, who knows, like it'll some be, oh, uh, like yeah, he loves like something that's like scary. That's Desmond. Oh, that's Desmond. Everything all, more. Yeah, exactly. All the time about the, you you should know, do the those with those four-headed like horseman kind of make stuff up. Yeah. yeah. But you know what I love too is sometimes what I like to do is I like to create a character that's them. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, and and it's and they know it's they, they kind of know it's them. Right. But like I tell them it's the same age as them, right. the same look as them. Well, they really. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's important. Yeah. Exactly. Dude, that's so cool. Well, what's the guy that the real salt guy from yesterday? Jay. He, he basically has been his kids are older now, but he would tell them these bedtime stories that he would make up and he published them. So now he gave us a copy. Brilliant. Yeah, I'm gonna give you once we're done with it. Because yeah. uh, he was okay. like seeing his 15, 14, 15 year old getting into all these Harry Potter books and he's like, what if I can write a book and be like the cool author to my son? That, yeah. That's something I'm absolutely gonna do. I, I love that. Children's books. Have you, yeah, have children's you read books. The, the, the dragon one from Jocko? Yes. Okay, so that one that one's pretty good because the yes. other ones were good. like more for like Jared's age. Oh, actually Desmond, Desmond loves, loves it. Warrior and, and Dean, Dean likes it too, but the second one, the dragon one, or the third one, the dragon one was even better for Dean, you know, because it's just a picture book, a big picture book. Yeah, I always kind of get challenged with what story, what me, if I could tell one message to, to it, like the world of yeah. kids, what would it be, you know? I don't know, I have to really be clear on that, yeah. you can deliver the story, yeah. right? I, love it. I mean, the dragon one is a good one, because it's like uh, so many different messages, like everybody says don't go over there because dragons and then when you go there it's a whole different story than mm -hmm. what you think it is it's like facing your fears and and all that i think the greatest kids book of all time is i am by wayne dyer oh yes I think it's the, you read that. That's good. well you know i told you yeah, about it one. yeah because i got it because it was recommended after i purchased another book that you told me and it was recommended and so i got it and then i told you about it and you were like that was your favorite for a long time that is that one's great most powerful words man yeah i am amazing. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah, great. yeah. Wayne is my the, my uh, avatar. Like, I oh, do, I was listening I to Wayne his Oprah How amazing! I, so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah like, you could he just keep listening to it over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm so sad that he passed. Like, he's a man who I would love to go. Was well, it wasn't no cancer or anything? Or? I don't remember. I don't remember. So I keep in touch with his daughter. I like I messaged her on Instagram. You know that Presley's so, middle name is named so. after his daughter. That's it was the most amazing. It was the first time in my life I'd ever seen that type of relationship between a father and a daughter. I was like, that's right. That's right. That's awesome. I love that. Amazing, man. Well, we're getting there. So we got okay. two more questions. Yeah, we got two more questions. Um, if you had the attention of everyone in the world right now, what would be your one and only piece of advice to them? Well, you guys can ask such hard questions. <laughs> yeah, Danny. I didn't. I didn't think of this one. Cause Gosh, Danny. I don't like I when people ask me this good. question. I figured, like, if I if if I tell them ahead of time. Yeah. So we tell them. Ahead of time. <laughs> hey, you got thirty seconds notice. Think of all. I warned you. I warned you. Have one. What's it, so ask the question again. So, so if you had everyone's attention okay. in the world right now, what would the one piece of advice be? Though? Love yourself and forgive yourself and thank yourself and acknowledge the sacrifices and yeah and that's it like appreciate for yourself everything you do yeah. because sometimes we don't always um, we don't always acknowledge the things that we do for ourselves celebrate your wins right and I think. Yeah. Doing that um, and, and telling yourself that you're you're enough and that you are uh, amazing and you're being here as a blessing um, is maybe all you need to then start to exude your love and your light that's inside of you because people you know don't want to don't want to show that vulnerability because of fear of being taken advantage of or fear of whatever. Yeah. Um, but I think learning to love yourself is is the root of. Uh, joy, the root of happiness, the root of fulfillment, right? And if you can't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. And I lived that life for a long time. Um, you know, not being able to connect with anybody, like, on the deepest levels. Mm -hmm. um, and it's challenging, man. And, and when you start to accept yourself and start to acknowledge, you know, the sacrifices, and it's, it's a powerful place to come from. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think others around you will acknowledge that, right? And if you can envision the light that lives inside of you as a little flicker of a candle flame, 
And how do you get that light to burn so bright that it illuminates the world? Well, it starts with like loving every every bit of that light and loving every bit of that Amazing. person inside of you. And that's, if I could tell the world that, I mean, that would be a, that again, maybe a little bit esoteric, but. No, it's good. That's, yeah. That's, yeah. The, that's the embodiment of the I Am book too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> The light, man. I mean, and I, I've envisioned that every night before bed when I meditate. Like I meditate in my bed. It's like how can I make my light bigger? How can I how can I fan the light? And the light will be this beautiful thing that you can bring to the world in every relationship and everything you come to. Just be the greatest version of you. That's ultimately what that means, right? And don't be afraid. You know, the, the, again, another line that's just so powerful for me is, and I don't know whoever said this. I've heard it from many people, but our, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. And, yeah. and I felt that in my life yeah. in some really unique times. And I was like, oh, God, that's so true. Like, I not just cognitively got it. I felt it. And like, that's absolutely true. It is. It's absolutely true. It is true. Yeah. Love that, man. Love so that. before we let you go, just want to know what you're currently working on and how people can find you. Working mm -hmm. on a ketogenic muscle building program with Danny <laughs> Vega. Sounds great. Yeah, so we, I mean, we have an awesome opportunity to train together so often. Like, so we decided let's put something together to help people because both of us had some unique realizations during that training fear, that training yes. phase, right? So giving all that wisdom to your followers and mine, uh, I'm working on that. And I'm, I'm, I'm building my book. So having exited professional bodybuilding, I had a lot of lessons to learn. Um, and there's a lot of things that go into building a great body that people don't acknowledge that I really believe would make it so much easier for them. Like, if you just learn to pay attention to these certain particular things, um, you can, everyone can build muscle. Everyone can build a body that they love. Are you going to be Mr. Olympia? No. You right. can build an amazing body for you. Right. Um, so that's what I'm working on. So I build it and I frame it around the six pillars of a lean, healthy, and muscular body. So these six things that are outside of you that influence your internal state. So your internal state determines, you know, whether you're going to build muscle, right? Oh, yeah. Or burn fat or accumulate fat or whatever. So we have these six things, these six kind of pillars that live outside of us that impact our internal state. So giving people all the action items to impact this, the six pillars is what I'm working on. I'm building each of the six pillars, which will eventually uh, condense down into the book. So I'm working on that. That's yeah, That'll yeah. be out before the end of this year. Oh, fun. Love awesome. That, and then Instagram, website. Yeah, you can find me somewhere on the internet. <laughs> we'll put it all in the show notes. Yeah, um, BPAC Fitness is the Instagram. I think I've just changed my Twitter to that too, So, uh, or soon will. It used to be IFBB Ben Pack, if that's... Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that. So, again, not removing myself in any way from my past as a bodybuilder, but just acknowledging that I feel like I... I I am more than just a bodybuilder, right? right. So sometimes you get pigeonholed right. as, oh, that guy's a pro bodybuilder. And I'm sure everyone heard that one or thought that one when they started listening to the episode. It's like, oh, he's a pro bodybuilder. But <laughs> there's more to it, man. There's, there's more to that, right? There, there's more to this person in this story and hopefully more to offer. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate you guys very much. Oh, this is Love so you, good. Beautiful. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you.